All right, Matthew, welcome to module five, periodization, combining the pieces. The overview for module five is Will's five training phases, recapping our energy systems, when to do each phase, how to do each phase, who does each phase. One thing we're not going to cover in this module is multiple seasons or multiple peaks within a season. We're kind of just going to focus on the, the big goal at the end of a season or build up. So let's get into it. So these are the five training phases I like to use at the fundamental level. We've got base, event specific, taper, race, and recovery. There's often, you know, a lot of phases that have thrown in between base and taper. And this can really confuse people when you have various endurance events and you have different seasons or multiple races or one singular large ultra. And I like to use just event specific and we can target the specifics of our event in a few different ways. And so we want to kind of get through that in the rest of the slides. So what we've got is pretty much two to three week blocks within a training blocks. So that'd be followed by a recovery or a down week within these phases. And we can start to piece that together to ensure that we get a continuous improvement in fitness and conditioning towards our event. And so that's what we want to get over. Matt, how do you see your phases and compared to like what I've put here? Yeah, first off, I really like this word diagram you made. So that's yeah. really nice to see. And I think we can get a bit carried away with our different training phases. And I like what you've done here with the simplicity because I've seen things before like, Base one, base two, base three. Is there a base four? Is there a base five? Build one, build two. And, you know, really, base two is just a different kind of base training that has well, taken the next. Uh, we've got these slides, so let's okay. not get ahead of ourselves, so, man. Well, well yes, uh, that's all I want to say is that, you know, using these simple terms avoids confusion, right? And getting the language uh, straight between our athletes and between coaches is good and i think that's why some of the other terminology has stuck around for so long but then for someone coming in totally new hasn't read the same training books as we have it's a little bit confusing so what you've done here is really simple i like it yeah the other thing i wanted to do was make it cyclic as well because these cycles these training phases can be used in like a singular micro phase or the larger macro phase because we may be racing you know tapering recovering very quickly within like a small four week block or we may be you know doing it across a, a six month or a one one year build up and i like what you say when we are talking language when we did our training zones we wanted to have the same training zones mean the same thing to me you your athlete my athlete and everyone in between and it's the same kind of thing here where you just need to have an athlete understand if it's in base phase there are specific demands of that and it's mainly easy training volume based easy training for the most part then when you're in event specific phase you know the intensity and the quality of the sessions is more important than the overall volume so you kind of just say you know you have a greater capacity to rest here because you have some real specific event targeted sessions whereas in the base phase you can push on under a bit of fatigue because each session should not be you know as taxing as an event specific one but we'll get into it as we go through these phases first off matt we need to recap our energy systems okay so we we talked about energy systems a bunch so far and that's because well actually what we're doing in training is trying to stress these energy systems so how do you see that fitting within a periodized plan well well very much like we've discussed throughout these modules is we need to target what is the predominant energy system, the aerobic system within our training, but we cannot neglect the other two and more specifically, we can't neglect the anaerobic system. But then with the anaerobic system, you have the fatiguing nature of that training. So there really needs to be a structure around it. We've talked about how to target each energy system with our training zones, and we'll just touch on that. And we've also discussed like kind of the importance of the aerobic system. So now we get to start to put it into an overall season plan. So we just need to remember like what are we trying to do within each phase? And then within the phase, we have the zones 
and within the zones we have the energy systems and so it all comes back to the same line of thinking and same line of science again so we're speaking that same language so we just need to also recap you know our zones so we know where we're putting our focus through these phases all right when we talk base phase we talk utilizing our zone two zone two we've just cut zone one off because whatever it's a recovery like we all know easy 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 and easier than that that's zone one <laughs> and when then we so we move on to zone two and zone two that's that's what we're focusing on with our base phase we can touch on some of the other zones but in reality like we just have that one main focus and depending on the athlete we can you know leverage those other zones as we see fit but the base phase is zone two that's that's our correlation is there anything you'd want to add to that matt well i would say you know zone one to zone two is endurance pace so we can kind of have a little bit of that zone one in there i think that's okay if we need to tone down uh, a few periods in the the zone two because what we see with a lot of athletes is they just put it push to the top of the zone two which you know there's a little bit of leeway built into those i think but you know the the whole point is primarily get our energy from fat and to train our ability to create our energy that way and if we're going fast we just can't do it yeah that's exactly right so that's just a recap of the energy systems and our zones and so now we get into base phase one like the first phase of base phase yeah i like how you say that you know first phase of base so like it's base and base is base is base right so it doesn't matter how many times we do it but the reason we kind of separate it into one two three potentially is because we just can't train forever and we need to have different phases where we're continuously pushing the boundaries and stepping up uh with some recovery in between there yeah that's right so base phase one let's get training is really a way to introduce more so like new athletes athletes who've just signed up or if you are an athlete yourself if you're coming back from injury like a lot a long break we're all motivated you know we're all encouraged to to get out there push ourselves and base phase one is really trying to establish what is this athlete's training load what can they handle what's their weekly structure how does it all work across four i generally like to use four weeks sometimes six weeks depending on how green or new the athlete is. And really, I'm just putting in aerobic training, maybe a specific kind of, you know, short interval, long rest kind of workout so that there's a bit of excitement in there, but not too much physical demand. And then like what Matt likes to use, um, some kind of technique-based thing to incorporate, you know, increase the excitement within the workout. But really, base phase one is just, you need to figure out what this athlete can handle outside, you know, which can often be very different to what they say they can handle. And, outs, you know, alongside what they can handle, also, like, how much time do they have? How much time are they actually going to be able to dedicate to the training plan? Because I've said it before, I'll say it again, 95% of people do not complete the training plan 100% of the time. Yeah, and I think, like, what the athlete has completed before and what they can complete could also be different so even if we're looking at their past training it's important to have this kind of a phase just to relearn the athlete even if they think they know themselves and we see that in their past training we need to understand how they respond to different exercise so it's good to go through this when we start working with a new athlete yeah and for like your more experienced athlete base phase one is a good way to ensure that their longevity throughout an entire season is maintained along with motivation because you're holding them back early you're not jumping straight into the full-on weekly volume straight out the bat so from there we move on to to base phase two within base phase two i like to incorporate the 80 20 rule you know we've seen it all around it applies to so many facets of our life uh depends on what books you read but you have 20 percent of hard training and 80% aerobic base phase kind of training. So the 20%, like how do you apply this, Matt? I get a lot of questions. Is this 80-20 per session? Is this 80-20 per week, per month? Is this 80-20 by a time, by a heart rate, like by distance? What, 
like how do you see this 80 20 being applied within a plan yeah i think um 20 going hard 20 percent of the time is a lot so when i see 80 20 i'm thinking wow someone can go hard 20 percent of the time that they're spending training if you're spending 10 hours a week you're you know that's two hours of going hard in a week so i generally start to think of this as sessions right so if we have 10 sessions maybe two of them will be hard not going hard 20 percent of the time so that's the way i see it yeah like in our analyzing training module we went through the fundamental like basic five pillars of analysis and that's kind of where i start here as i go 80 20 like you said 10 hours of training two hours is probably going to be dedicated to a specific workout you know where you've got eight hours is some kind of aerobic base phase training like targeted aerobic development and then you've got two hours of a session within that session who knows how many intervals you have or how like much time or distance is made up of actual high intensity stuff then from there you know start in the deep dive start in the deep dive of the analysis and go all right across a week how much time did we spend in our different power zones heart rate zones that kind of thing and we can start to see Generally, I'll just try and check that we have 80% of, or approximately 80% of our time during training is spent in zone one and two heart rate. And that's kind of like the next step on. And that's how I use it as well, Matt. So it's not, it's definitely not like you're allowed to do 20% hard each session, which often a lot of people see that as. Um, uh, it's, yeah. it's more like a very... A lot of when I do a presentation similar to this, it's called Introduction to Distance Running or like Endurance Sports. I talk about this and it's a question I get a lot, like how how much can I do? Because everyone loves to loves to thrash themselves. Yeah. It's and like the so, coolest thing. Like it's a yeah, good like, feeling. So you feel like you're working hard. If you give them if you give yourself twenty percent rain within a workout, by the time you know you're doing a 30, 45 minute session. By the time you you have the heart rate slow component, you get the bread, you get the media session. You can go as hard, almost as hard as you want, and then you burn out and chill out for for the final 10, 15 minutes of, of your workout. There you go, eighty twenty. Um, so it's not that. <laughs> no, definitely not. Like we don't go hard uh, every day. No way, that would be impossible. I think really the, what this reinforces is this reinforces an entire training plan. And it says 80% of our sessions should have been really, really easy. And if there were more sessions than that going hard, um, we could have done better because we need to focus on developing our aerobic system. And we don't do that when we're going hard. Part of doing this is around, if we're looking at, you know, in Training Peaks, the performance management chart, we can look at the ATL or acute training load. And that's going to give us an indication of how much load an athlete is taking on in about a seven day window. And when you're in the base phase, you're coming off of not a lot of hard training, not a lot of competition, and your cap capability or capacity to absorb like hard training and a large short term training load or acute training load is not what it is at the end of a base phase or even a build phase, race specific phase, race season however you want to, whatever you want to call it. And so that's just something to be mindful of as well. All right, so here's my pro tip. So my pro tip is to look at time and zones, heart rate or power or pace, depending on what your main predominant measure is, and just look at the percentage contribution across a week of training. And that way you can see what percentage time they spent above zone two. So that can be a quick way to check your 80-20 rule. Uh, I've never seen this graph before. I like that actually. So you can just look across. So you're looking across the last four weeks. And you're saying how much of this time was spent basically going easy. And it looks like most of it. That's right. Yep. Super simple one to do um, within the within the athlete dashboard. So the third and final phase of the phase, phase of the base phase, reinforcing the foundations. Within base phase three, we should have established our total or like max training load. And we should be starting to incorporate some of the specifics of our event. Obviously, if we are doing an ultra marathon, 
or an Ironman, we need to start incorporating some of like the really long runs, rides, swims, that kind of thing to ensure that we are preparing specifically for our event. So within the base phase three, we need to reinforce our foundation. So the focus is still around that 80-20, but we can start to increase the total training load via volume. And that's going to be really our probably our longest training weeks within base phase three. And that will ensure that we are as fit as possible with the largest aerobic capacity as possible before we enter into our event specific phases. What Will just said about the base training three, you know, his third base training phase, I think that's fallen on some deaf ears. And, you know, people are thinking, well, actually, we need to go hard, go hard, go hard. But don't forget what we talked about with lactate threshold is that we want to get our lactate threshold as high as possible. Because if we get that as high as possible, we can repeat hard efforts over and over more efficiently. So this graph is just kind of showing across the season. And so what this shows with two runners is that as a runner gets more fit and has lactate threshold occur at a higher speed, they're just able to go faster. And this shows us that we really want our lactate threshold to be as high as possible so we can do as much work as possible going easy. That's right. And when we start to see the very left of the graph, which I guess would be where lactate begins to appear in the blood at a measurable concentration if we are as aerobically developed as possible like you just think of the fittest aerobically fit individual so if you're looking at triathlon it's Jan Frodeno you know if you're looking at mountain biking it's it's Nino Schurter in cross country you look at those individuals their lactate is not going to start even like featuring on the spectrum until well to the right of the graph where if you've got, got someone off the couch pretty much as soon as they start jogging lactate shoots up so just by doing the base phase we can start to push this graph to the right where you see the good runner with a shallower curve and a longer curve and then with what we're about to get into around event specific we can target that threshold as well to help develop the buffering capacity and tolerance of lactate around that threshold so that's what we can do there and that's where we can now move on to the event specific phase all right so when we have the event specific phase we have a couple of approaches to take on so you have a race season where you have minor events with the major event and then you have a single major event on the other hand of the column so when we're talking about this we're kind of thinking about a cyclist and then an Ironman or an ultra athlete. Obviously, you're not going to have a whole season of ultra races. And then in cycling, you're not just going to have one singular event that you do, unless you're doing kind of an across, race across America style. But for cycling, mountain biking, you know, you're racing week in, week in, week in, week out almost. Whereas with a single major event, and especially running, you just you can't race every weekend. So what you'll do is you'll have some specifics within your training to really prepare you so you have like practice races when we're talking about these big ultra single event single major peak you have to make sure you are as prepared as possible for that event so within training you're going to have incorporated all the demands or as much of the demands as possible of your major event so you want to be doing you know if it's a trail ultra you're on a trail with a similar kind of terrain, with a similar kind of topography and the similar kind of temperatures so that you can get the demands of that event, see what your pacing looks like, see what your outputs are looking like, see what your hydration requirements are, your equipment requirements. All of that is going to have to be built into your training as opposed to if we go to the left-hand side, and Matt can probably speak more to this working with so many cross-country mountain bikers and enduro events where that, that almost every weekend you can start to use those early season events to bring yourself up as your event specific training because literally like it is event specific as it can get yeah like with mountain bikers we don't do just one race we're normally doing a dozen or 20 races in a season and to be ready for every single event and to be at our tippy top shape for every single event just means that we're going to be more well rested for each one of them and to be more well rested we need to do less training so 
It just means that our fitness overall is lower because we've done less training because we're fresh for every event. So what we normally do is we pit target a few parts of the season and we'll train towards those and use the events leading into it as training events. And what that means is that we've done more training in the lead up to those events because they're not as big of a priority and we're a little bit more tired heading into them. That doesn't mean we're going to go really slow in them. It just means they're not as big of a priority. That's right. And when you have these multiple events within a season, it does become really hard to maintain and build fitness. And that's why these base phases, although in like when you try and, you know, you look at something like a mountain bike event or cycling where you're going hard, easy, hard, easy, a lot of big power outputs, big climbs, long efforts, um, short efforts. And you look at base phase training, you go, this has no correlation whatsoever. You know, where are my sprints? Where where are my threshold intervals? Where where are my high out power output workouts you know, like each and every week? Where the base phase does work super well is that it builds your fitness to the point where it's kind of, you know, at, at its peak and then allows you to maintain that for longer throughout your season and then you are able to put your event specific demands so pretty much you know your lactate threshold strength high power out sprint muscle recruitment neurological recruitment patterns output stuff specific stuff on top of that really solid foundation if you've tried to do that for the you know 12 to 16 weeks before the season even started you don't have a lot of room to move you, you you're going to then be trying to incorporate those five phases I talked about like between every single race. Oh damn, now I need to do my long ride because I haven't done one for for X amount of time and and it just becomes like this vicious cycle of yeah, kind of diminishing returns, plateauing, regression, overtraining. And, and no good events either. Like all event just becomes kind of average. Yeah, that's right. You may find you'll get you start the season and there'll be that dude you've seen out riding his bike super slow, getting dropped on the hills, and you kick his or her ass first race of the season. You're straight in there, straight out the blocks. No doubt, because you've been doing the training for that, and that makes sense. But when the season's three months long, they start to get stronger and stronger and continue to improve or at least maintain their performance, whereas you start to really struggle and and figure try to figure out, like, what was I doing you know, what did I do, Matt? We've been here. What yeah. did I do at the first race? Ah, oh, I was doing a long ride. I was doing hard intervals and I was doing my strength training and I was doing my stretching and I was doing all of my aerobic rides, right? And so you try and do all that between your worst, you know, the crappy race you just had and the next race. Yeah, and, and then it, you're just really, really tired, right? <laughs> Whereas if you have a really big base, heading into the season you don't have to really stress as much yeah so i think like if if you have a well prepped base phase and you lead into a a, se- a race season i think it leads better to avoid overtraining because you know having worked with being uh, an ultra athlete like coming from half ironman ironman now ultra trail running we kind of just leave it till that one event we may do one, three, four weeks out, maybe even further out than that, if it depends how long it is. But we we don't have those continuous like tests because in training you can kind of lie to yourself. Oh, of course I was a bit off today. You know, of course my pace was power was a bit down because you know I'm in a big. Tra- I'm doing an ultra event. I'm supposed to be tired, and you can actually dig and dig and dig, and then not be able to get yourself out of that hole when you come near the race because it's all it's it's easy to lie. It's easy to lie to yourself. I've been there. And and so when you get to the taper, you, you can't get out of it. So I find the risk of overtraining a lot lot higher, not just because of the distance or time that someone has to race, but because of the way the season gets structured. Um, so that, yeah, I guess that leads on to tapering. Again, we have the, our, our two columns where you have your race season and yet you have your single major event. And I'll speak to the single major and I'll let Matt speak to more of the race season about how he does it. But for the single major event, three weeks out, even four weeks out, depending on your fitness level, is going to be where you want to do the, the big dog, the big day, the big hitter, 
that's that's the point at which you uh, you're putting all your kit on. You're bringing out your number ones. You're getting prepped. You, you're waking up at the time. You, you're doing your kind of test event, and you're doing it at event intensity. So if it's a hundred k, you know most of the time I'm putting people out for fifty k's, and most of the you know competitive athletes putting them out for fifty k's, up to sixty k's, and we go out and we go and try and do the intensity for forty and maybe rev the engine for the last ten see what we've got, see what the capacity is, see how all our nutrition is. But from there, like a 50, 60K run requires a huge amount of recovery, especially when you do it at the end of a training block. So three to four weeks out, you want a huge amount of time to be able to recover. The hard work's done, the conditioning's done. Now it's just about maintaining. A little sharpening up, but really all you need to be on race day for an ultra event is super fresh. You can't lose fitness, you won't lose fitness over three or four weeks, and you will continue to train. You just need to really reduce the volume and flush all that fatigue out of the legs so that you can be fresh, not from hour one to hour five, but from hour seven to 10 to 15, because that's where any fatigue or residual fatigue you have from your training will still be left in your body. And so that's how I approach a single major event taper yeah cool like i think we really approach the same we use the same approach when we have like a major peak with mountain bikers throughout the yep. season so even though they're doing a ton of events throughout the season they still have these main focuses and we're going to do that same kind of taper leading into those major events but then we're going to have those other events and really i i don't like to do too much heading into them because if we just take away training for a couple of days, we just end up feeling really lethargic, right? So you know how you feel like in rest week and a lot of athletes just get sick in a rest week because the training volume just suddenly disappears and their immunity kind of goes away for a little bit. And we, you start to feel flat because your blood volume starts to reduce. And if we're doing that heading into every one of our training events, they're just not going to go that well, right? So we just will usually maybe only add a day of rest heading into like a B or a C priority event. But um, really, we feel really good when we continue training and we're not training too hard. So if we have a, a hard training session in the middle of uh, a pretty tough week, we usually feel pretty good for that. So if we feel that same way going into a B or a C priority event, that's actually not a really bad thing. So we just kind of treat it like another hard training day. That's right, because if you... If you think that you can maintain a full training load and incorporate your your race well one you're probably right but two you're you're not going to get the most out of the event in terms of your performance and then the adaptation because you want to thrash yourself like these events it's important to to go real deep and into that red zone so that you can get that adaptation find that feeling and then recover from it and the recovery isn't going to be like what it is from a major event it'll be like easy training right Matt like you can incorporate you can continue to incorporate training as recovery especially if you have that huge aerobic base yeah yeah exactly so we'd probably have like a day off and then maybe take away one really hard day and then continue with our training after that race and it wouldn't be really hard after that race and then we can kind of keep going and work, work on our aerobic conditioning because we take a lot out of us. So when we're looking at taper, here we have overreaching and overtraining. And this really represents what we've just discussed with you having a single major race and the risk of overtraining and then overreaching with a continuous race season or race calendar where you're racing you know, almost every weekend. So if you look at the, the blue line there, it, it zigs up and down. And hopefully through, you know, you come in and you have like your performance level, like the, the base kind of level, which is that black line in the middle. And coming off a of base phase, maybe you're a little underdone, right? Or overdone, however you want to say it. But as we race and we recover, we start to increase our adaptation to our training. You know, we're starting to apply those those harder sessions on top of our aerobic development 
and we recover from them, which is also important. And so maybe, you know, after a couple big races, we've regressed a little bit and we're, we're below that black line. But as we progress through our season, hopefully we've been able to maintain a bit of aerobic development as well as our peaks, you know, our event specific training. And we can start to, along with that adequate recovery, compensate, adapt and improve. And that's the blue line. Then we have the green line, which is under recovery. And this is definitely how I approach ultra events because, you know, if when you're running 100 miles or you're doing an Ironman, it's it's taking on average, well, an Ironman is taking on average about 13 hours and 100 miles is taking pretty much a day, right? Like to get the buckle, you've got to go into 24. So we can't do that. We just can't do that every weekend. We can't do that most, you know, once a month you can't train for more than like a, a steady 10 hours. So what we have to do is under recover so that there is a large amount of residual fatigue within our body so that when we do train, we, we're starting to feel what it might be like to be at hour nine or kilometer 100 or mile, you know, 80 within your event. And with that means you start to dig pretty deep into, into the under recovery hole or the overreaching overtraining pit. And what we want to be able to do is allow ourselves to have this, you know, like I said, really long three to four week taper to pull ourselves that red line, that active recovery, that taper line all the way back up to the race. And we get this huge super compensation. Whereas if we don't, if we progress a bit too far, if we don't have those micro recoveries, you know, you see the zigzagging green line. If we don't have those, then we will continue to under recover and under recover. We won't get any recovery. And then as we get towards the race, we won't get any soup and compensation. We'll pretty much just be overtrained, overtrained. Yeah. We'll just be We've been there. and you'll be flat. Yeah. I've been there. I can see. Uh, yeah, for sure. And that's that's the risk. That is the, the, the real risk um, of of these big events and not continuously being able to test yourself. Um, and like being scared of the distance can also force you down that rabbit hole. Um, well, I've seen many athletes lost down there, myself included. A way we can look at our training overall, like holistically and our phases to make sure we're on track is to use the performance management chart within training peaks. People love this. First off, it does not directly represent your fitness. Does it, Matthew? No, it does not. But that doesn't mean it's bad. Actually, I think this is really good. Like this is about as good as it gets. You know, so if we record every training session and we're taking into account other things in our lives and we're not using this as the end all be all of our fitness. I think it's a very, very good tool to use to track our fitness. Yeah. And this is taken from an athlete I worked with, uh, a, a professional triathlete. And so you can see here, we've got our race season, right? So we've got our, our main training blocks where we have, if you're looking right at the left, we've, we've got base phase. So some pretty hefty training loads going on there. Then there's like a test race and some rest. And then we get into like the next training block, which is event specific. So obviously the ATL or the pink line, the acute training load or the fatigue is, is not as high in the following training block because we have a larger amount of recovery, more demanding sessions, but larger amount of recovery. But you can see what happens in the race season. If we're looking at the blue line, the chronic training load, aka fitness, it starts to decline and but we're able to minimize. We're not, we weren't forcing training. We weren't, definitely weren't forcing the load. And you can see the orange or yellow, which is representative of freshness, increase all the way up until the end of the season before we get into subsequent training blocks and, and sickness. Like you can only train so much. And, but what you can do by looking at these, especially retroactively, like this is when we sat down at the end of the year to go over things, we can go through it and go, you know what, this was too long. 
this was too short, these were too high. And it's going to make sure, it's just keeping you on track. You know, you have these goals, you have these base phase goals and boxes you want to tick. So you can actually just go back and go, did we do it? And I know, Matt, like with you, you say you'll you'll pull up like three years and try and compare them across those years to see where those different peaks and troughs happen. Yeah, it's important. Like if we have a, a long history with an athlete that we're able to compare season to season, not just what we did one season uh, to the next or within uh, a season. Um, but I really like what you did here with this graph. And I think a lot of people are going to be looking at this scratching their heads and seeing that blue line, which represents fitness going down across race season. So in terms of confidence with an athlete, like how does that affect the confidence of an athlete to be able to just focus on being really, really fresh? Would you be able to talk about this one a little bit? Yeah. What was, I guess, really good with this athlete is he was one of those guys that just looked at the session, right? So I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here where you have some athletes, they go, tell me what I need to do. It says, it says 60 minute bike ride. I do a 60 minute bike ride. No problems. If I'm tired, I don't do it. Like kind of the ideal ones, uh, you know, you're the data guy. I pay you for my data, for the training, for the analysis. You do that. Come to me when, when you've got something important to tell me, then you have the other ones who go, yeah, I know what I'm doing and I'm going to help you not the other way around they go oh I'm, you know i'm a blue my fitness is declining and um yeah they, like again if i've had a season like this with one of those athletes and what happened man i tell me if you've heard this before there'd be another session pop up like oh okay <laughs> yeah like and, and we did there was a rest day oh it was an easy 60 minute run I was like, okay, well, there's no such thing. And I didn't plan for that. So let's, you know, but I need, you know, my, my CTL is dropping below 80. It, it, you know, I was 84 last time. And, and it, it can be so incredibly hard to try and educate your athlete when something's called fitness and it's going down. It just, it's a hard one to get your head around. But in terms of this athlete, this is what I did for him at the end of the season. I didn't, he didn't look at it like at all it was all all me until i i showed him how where potentially we went wrong with his some of the results and sickness that we tried to push the season out too far but uh yeah it's it can be it can be a struggle right yeah definitely i think like it's important to remember though that like fitness doesn't mean performance like just because you're more fit doesn't mean you're going to perform better because Performance is a mixture of fitness and freshness. And if you're not fresh, you're not going to be able to perform. And we see this all the time with our athletes when they have their rest periods, which is also part of training, right? It's built into this and it's a, a training phase that, you know, we'll test before and we'll test after our rest periods. And they're so surprised that after a month of no training, nothing's changed. So um it you know the the fitness will be way down in that case but that doesn't mean that their performance is always going to be down because you just get more fresh when you're resting so it's about finding that mixture yeah that's right and it's just it's representative you know it's it's not a direct correlation between your your fitness and the, the blue line so my pro tip number two is measuring progress so throughout your whole periodization your whole period from start to peak race it's really important to continue to measure the progress of your athlete and you can do this in a few different ways but really you want your fixed variable so the the one thing that stays the same every single time if i'm thinking running i'm thinking distance i'm thinking of 5k right never changes then you have your independent variable which changes against your fix so you got 5k independent obviously time right so you have your fixed and then time fluctuates ideally we want it to keep going down 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 you want to get faster and faster and faster we could also use power output we could use heart rate bunch of things but we want that one fixed one and then we want that one independent one that we look at or maybe a couple and i like to use a short one and a long one so short one you know something like one to two minutes and we can see how the anaerobic capacity of an athlete is improving tracking decreasing 
during different phases along with the long one which represents kind of you know like an aerobic capacity so above eight minutes and that's what i like to keep within the whole structure of a periodized training plan so that we can start to see you know all right somehow through the base phase we're, we're continuing to improve anaerobic capacity one minute peak power keeps going up so maybe we don't need to apply like a greater stress of harder more quote-unquote specific training for this individual because what we're doing now it seems to be working really well and the main goal obviously is to improve is to improve and get to the race fresh and ready so measuring progress great way incorporate it throughout the program and it helps keep you and the athletes on track so i think this is also really good for all of us know-it-all coaches because we think that we've been coaching for a long time we've coached so many really good athletes that you know we don't need to do these kind of things and that there's no reason why one minute power will improve in base phase uh, so we're not even going to test it but actually i've seen one minute power improve so many times in a base phase and i think you know even for us coaches that have seen all the athletes and have seen all the different training techniques i think we should still be testing pretty much everything just so we can learn more and even if we don't learn something specifically for this athlete, in this case, we're going to learn something for our other athletes for in the future. All right, frequently asked questions. So I mentioned it, like what is 80-20? I get that a lot. So we're talking about 80% easy training across a week. You know, so if you're training five hours, one of those hours is going to be dedicated to like a hard session. That doesn't mean that every single session has to have 20% of it being hard. It's just across a week or across a month. You can have a look especially heart rate zones, super easy time and zone across the last 28 days in training peaks. And you'll see, cool, what are my percentage breakdowns across those zones? Then do I really need a break from training, Matt? Like, do I really need rest and recovery days? Yes. Do I? Yes. A recovery Even phase. Is, yes. A recovery phase is a training phase and they maybe don't need to be completely resting, but uh, there will always be with every athlete at every level, a recovery phase where they are not exercising and there are recovery weeks scattered across the season as well. They're really important. They're really part of training. Yeah, that's right. I like to, I, I think rest and recovery, uh, maybe like, perceived as weakness words in, in our world and i think if we have like adaptation phase or like super compensation week it it might like spruce it up like, <laughs> yeah you know the less you do the greater athlete you become during this week you're like oh yeah all right less like like i'm gonna do nothing <laughs> Yeah. And probably for the athlete that goes from the extreme of whatever they were doing to nothing, that's probably really <laughs> applicable and proactive for them. Um, but yeah, still, Matt, can I push during a base phase? Can I push? And I guess that leads into like, what about what I, I got to go running with my friends? Yeah, I think like social exercise is super important. So we're always going to make sure to fit that in no matter when it happens. And we're going to build the training around that for sure. But that doesn't mean we're just going to go out and thrash ourselves in the middle of a base phase or really ever. Um, but, you know, fun stuff is definitely important. Yeah. And I think like the 80-20 kind of applies to that. And, and like you said, you know, we, we often have that bunch ride that group run like that session you know it's just going to be too hard it's and so you got to factor it it's just needs to be factored and you can have it but don't like otherwise it becomes where does it stop like where do you where do you stop going hundy and sprinting for every red letter box or tractor it just <laughs> it's just a very new zealand thing that. yeah yeah for sure like um we can like maybe convince your friends to go hard or to go <laughs> let me start over i think um maybe convince your friends to go easy with you they might actually enjoy it and you might all get faster give it a go see what happens yeah throw them uh throw them a heart rate you know you can just even the go to the training zones module check out the age-based heart rate super simple quickest one go, all right mate you're not allowed going over 150 that's that's the rule everyone would you know because is that there's that one athlete that just he's or she like just half wheel half strides just is always you know you gotta put the you gotta put the governor on them i think yeah for sure that'll control it 
All right, here's the podcast where we talked about Will not doing what he says, right? So he talked about himself overtraining. And this was yeah. a really good podcast kind of diving into what happens when you don't really follow the plan that you have laid out for yourself or you kind of overestimate what you can do in training. So this is a really good episode. I think you'll really enjoy it. Dr. Matt and I started the Performance Advantage podcast to help runners, riders, and outdoor competitors integrate sports science more effectively into their training and racing. So over the last few years, Dr. Will and I have covered topics like the lactate threshold, training zones, power meters, and fatigue. Now we're condensing these popular and misunderstood topics into practical courses. Our courses take our same podcasting style approach to learning and education, and we break it down into bite-sized chunks that you can digest either all at once or as practical little resources to use as and when you need them. So the biggest difference between our course and any other course you might have taken is that we don't lecture you. It's a conversation between Will and I and we're explaining complex sports science principles in an easy to understand manner. Yeah, we also integrate like how we use them on the regular. Our courses come with a certificate of completion as well as a lot of takeaway resources such as training plans, scientific articles and quizzes that you can do to check your progress along the way. Our sports science courses are available now. Register on performanceadvantagepodcast.com for immediate access.